Well, hello and welcome everybody to ICMDA webinars. I'm Dr. Peter Saunders, the Chief Executive of the International Christian Medical and Dental Association, broadcasting you to you today from a sub-zero St. Albans in the UK. Yes, it's very cold here. So ICMDA brings together uh, about 60,000 Christian doctors and dentists from over 80 countries worldwide. And today we're privileged to have uh, on uh, number 132 of our ICMDA webinar series, Dr. Stephen Willing to speak to us on the subject of top 10 myths of the sexual revolution. And I'll introduce him very shortly. So it's a real pleasure to have uh, at our last webinar of the year of 2022, Dr. Stephen Willing on the top 10 myths of the sexual revolution. The sexual revolution, as most understand it, began in Western societies in the decade of the 1960s, and it promoted a sexual a narrative directly opposed not only to Christian teaching, but also to universal principles that guided most of human civilization up until that point. And yet most research over the last four decades undermines the sexual revolution narrative, showing that the Christian sexual paradigm to be the pathway most conducive to human flourishing. And in this talk, Dr. Stephen Willing will examine 10 prevailing myths that are fundamental to the contemporary sexual narrative, but are refuted by the best and most current research. So uh, Dr. Stephen is an academic neuroscientist. He's got over 40 years of clinical experience in academic and private settings. He's currently a consultant in radiology at Tenwick Hospital in Kenya. He's a pediatric neurologist for the Children's uh, Hospital of Alabama, which is where he's, he's broadcasting from today. He's a visiting scholar with reasons to believe and an adjunct professor of divinity at Regent University. He's also the author of Atlas of Neuroradiology and more recently, Superbia, The Perils of Pride, The Power of Humanity. And his uh, personal blog on science apologetics, which goes under the intriguing title of the Soggy Spaniel, uh, can be found at www.swilling.com. Stephen, it's a great pleasure to have you today on ICMDA webinars, and we really look forward to, to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. I'm going to go ahead and share and just jump right in here. OK, we should be good. Okay, hello and welcome. In this series, I'll take a critical look at what I call the top 10 myths of the sexual revolution. My primary aim here is to defend and uphold biblical sexuality, primarily to a Christian audience, but it's also a lot more. My thesis is that all available evidence points to biblical sexuality as the optimal paradigm for human flourishing. But first, what do I mean by sexual revolution? In essence, the negation of God's design for marriage, sex, and children. In the biblical paradigm, which has been true in almost all civilizations in history, we begin with marriage as a central institution. Sex takes place only within marriage, and children only occur as a result of sex within marriage. Fix this image in your mind. Marriage is at the top of the hierarchy. This seemed to work very well for many thousands of years, and any deviation from this paradigm led to predictably bad consequences. The actual expression sexual revolution was coined by Wilhelm Reich. Reich was a successor to Freud, who ran his clinic in Vienna throughout the 1920s. In 1939, he immigrated to New York to join the New School for Social Research. Throughout his career, Reich advanced a number of very strange ideas, particularly pertaining to human sexuality. Because of his extravagant health claims and disturbing connections with sexual abuse, Reich was pursued by the Food and Drug Administration and eventually died in prison. In his final years, he became increasingly delusional, if not overtly psychotic. Let me just summarize by saying none of Reich's ideas survive in modern mainstream science. What we think of as the sexual revolution really took off in the 1960s, and I would argue that popular culture is a much more potent driving force than delusional Austrian psychotherapists. 
Its ultimate source is the father of lies. At its heart, it is the rejection of Judeo-Christian sexual morality. <clears throat> Let me elaborate on that. The sexual revolution severed traditional relationships between sex, marriage, and children. We could say it began with rupturing the tie between sex and children enabled by the pill in the 1960s. This was made possible by advancing technology and the Griswold decision in the United States Supreme Court. What this meant was that people could engage in intercourse without worrying about the natural consequence, dramatically lowering the cost of sex, especially for women, but men too. And if contraception did fail or was just too inconvenient, then you had abortion. Over 85% are among unmarried women. Next came the separation of sex from marriage, driven by pop culture, as well as some shoddy scholarship claiming that non-marital sex was healthy, normal, and free of consequences. Finally came the rupture between marriage and children. Illegitimacy is not the only cause. We mustn't forget divorce, which rose rapidly in the late 20th century with a nationwide move toward no-fault divorce and increasing social acceptance. But there's another side to stage one, Technology not only made it possible to have sex without children, it made it possible to have children without sex. There's a little overlap here. So instead of marriage, sex is at the top of the hierarchy. Some sexual relationships lead to or begin with marriage, but most do not. Children are usually within marriage, but often outside of marriage, and thanks to the fertility industry, don't even require sex. If you've read Brave New World, written 90 years ago, Huxley foretold all three stages. In his future dystopia, marriage is eliminated, and the break between sex and children is absolute. In that context, you might find this quote from Huxley quite revealing. For myself, as no doubt for most of my friends, the philosophy of meaningless was essentially an instrument of liberation from a certain system of morality. We objected to the morality because it interfered with our sexual freedom. So Huxley was pretty transparent about his motivations, but even in writing the book, he wasn't able to put lipstick on that pig. His imaginary future was a dystopia. Some Christians are skeptical of science in general, and usually the ones who don't know much about it. For reasons we don't need to go into, the relationship between science and faith can be complicated. The sexual revolutionaries confidently claim that science is on their side, but not only is science not on their side, it increasingly affirms the biblical view of human sexuality as the optimal pathway to human flourishing. Now I'm gonna present this as a top 10 myths. Now this isn't a countdown, they're organized more by topic than priority, but I will give you my opinion as to which one I think is the worst and it might not be what you expect. So let's proceed to the first myth. Gender is a social construct. Well, what does that mean? This is a claim that there are no intrinsic differences between men and women other than the physical ones, that everything pertaining to gender norms and roles is dictated by society. That idea emerged during what we call second wave feminism. First wave feminism was the movement starting in the late 1700s, advancing the empowerment of women and legal equality. Second wave feminism came along in the mid 20th century. One, it's a, one of its more noteworthy proponents was Simone de Beauvoir, the girlfriend of existentialist philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre. Simone is well known for her phrase, on ne n'est pas femme, on la devient, which translates, we are not born women, we become one. She was denying that anything related to femininity was biological or present at birth. Now, in the mid 20th century, that might have been a workable hypothesis, even if it sounded a bit fishy. But in the later 20th century, neuroscience research exploded. The 1990s were designated the decade of the brain by the NIH. And that research found that there are concrete, persistent, and pervasive differences between male and female cognition. Male children really are more aggressive, more systems oriented, and more inclined toward risk taking. Female children really are more empathetic, less aggressive, and risk averse. The complete list is much longer, but those are averages. There's no absolute wall between men and women, but a lot of overlap. Probably the one area where there is the least overlap is sex drive, where the difference between men and women is pretty large and persistent. But far from being culturally determined, 
These differences begin in utero and are already firmly established at birth. Even in the developing embryo, circulating testosterone causes male and female brains to develop differently, not in a way we can see structurally like on an MRI, but in the way that they are wired. If you want a good thorough read on this topic, I highly recommend Why Gender Matters by Leonard Sachs, now in a second edition. But this doesn't completely contradict De Beauvoir. It's not an either or. Some gender roles and behaviors, even how people dress, are culturally influenced. Virtually all bi modern Bible scholars argue, agree that Paul's extended riff on head coverings speaks to a social construct, not a moral concern, but this cuts both ways. If in older days they were pressured to act like women, now there's a lot of cultural pressure to make women act more like men. And how is that any different or better? But in 2022, we can reasonably declare that the science on this score is settled. In the January 2017 issue of the Journal of Neuroscience Research was completely devoted to articles reviewing the neuroscientific evidence of innate male-female differences. In his introduction, journal editor Larry Cahill wrote, the notion that sex matters fundamentally, powerfully, and pervasively for all of neuroscience, not just for reproduction, is an idea whose time as indeed has come. Well, we might say that idea came thousands of years ago, but better late than never. Now, is this common knowledge? Of course not. Most of the media and education establishment are still living in the 70s. Well, myth number 10 was pretty easy to knock off, so let's forge ahead. Number nine in our countdown, intercourse between consenting adults is harmless. So according to the prevailing secular narrative, it's morally neutral, harmless, possibly even healthy. The only constraint is mutual consent. This idea really took off in the 60s and has become the official dogma of the political left and most of the entertainment industry. In TV and movies, most romantic relationships end up in bed. Apart from a few rare exceptions, when are there ever any negative consequences? Well, let's do a reality check. Well, consequence number one should be pretty obvious. No matter what they say, contraception, even when it's used, is far from 100% successfully. Occasionally, intercourse still results in God's intended outcome. Number two, sexually transmitted diseases. This April, the CDC reported that 2020 was a record year for gonorrhea and syphilis, even in the middle of a COVID lockdown. Even the CDC recommends limiting the number of sexual partners, make that one or zero, and STDs cease to be an issue. Number three, the emotional consequences. There is a complex and unavoidable neurochemical response to sexual intercourse that impacts how one feels and how one behaves in the future. Intercourse results in a dopamine hit, which as you know, activates the brain's reward centers. Whatever you do that releases dopamine, your brain wants to keep doing more of it. That's true for gambling, jumping out of airplanes, birdieing on the 18th hole, or having sex. Sex also stimulates the production of oxytocin. This is known as the cuddle hormone and is part of God's design to facilitate emotional bonding between father and mother or mother and child. Vasopressin has a similar effect in men. The brain doesn't differentiate between a lifelong monogamous partnership and a one night stand, at least not initially. However, the brain is also highly malleable. It learns and adapts. So over time, it adapts to whatever lifestyle you pursue. Now this becomes problematic if someone later decides to enter a monogamous relationship after years of promiscuity. It's like trying to make a sudden course correction on an ocean liner. Joe McElhaney has compiled an excellent review of the neuroscience surrounding this subject here on your right. Lastly, there are the social consequences. Well, if one of the partners happens to be married to someone else, obviously it's a problem. How about if they're cohabitating or just going steady? An awful lot of conflict can be connected to something that's supposed to be harmless. As we continue our countdown, we come to myth number eight. Marriage is just a piece of paper. Well, this works like an ace of spades for men in cohabiting relationships who want to justify not marrying their partner. Most women, on the other hand, are not quite so thrilled about this line. But suppose it is true. Are there really no differences between married couples and cohabiting couples? Well, as you may suspect, the data shows otherwise. Here's an excellent review from Linda Waite and Maggie Gallagher. 
it was written around the turn of the millennium, so it's over 20 years old, but the data has really held up and continues to strengthen. Linda Wade is a social science researcher who studied marriage over many decades. Even by then, there was a wealth of data on the difference between cohabiting relationships and marriage. Couples who are married exhibited much higher levels of commitment to one another, both in their personal lives and specifically in the area of sex. They are more focused on the life of their partner and more concerned with their partner's interests. Adults who are married, especially women, are safer and at lower risk of abuse or violent death. This even extends to death from illness. Men who are married can expect a significantly greater life expectancy. And of course, married couples were consistently more financially secure. On the other hand, cohabiting partners exhibited much lower levels of commitment toward one another. The relationships were far less stable and of much shorter duration. Partners in a cohabiting relationship are less dependent upon the other person and less interested in their partner's life. In addition to all that, they are also inherently more violent with greater risk of domestic abuse. So it turns out that cohabitation is substantially inferior to marriage across a wide range of parameters. It's a whole lot more than a piece of paper. Throughout history, most people understood that. In position seven, we have the sexual revolution was a boon for women. Well, how do they justify that? Well, the claim is that it enabled women to pursue rich lives and fulfilling careers without the burdens of domestic responsibility and early motherhood. Even better, women were free to have sex whenever and with whomever they choose, just like men. Now, there's a little evidence that's what most women really want, but I can't speak for them. Of course, to advance this argument, they must assume that financial and legal equality with men was part and parcel of the sexual revolution, but that's what we call an equivocation fallacy. There was never a moral argument against legal equality for women, and support for this principle was widespread across Western society. This is what we classify under the term first wave feminism. The sexual revolution fell under the category of second wave feminism, that was not a natural progression, but a complete paradigm shift. As a consequence of the sexual revolution, young women today are marrying older and less likely ever to be married. <clears throat> With a decreased chance of marriage ever, there is a decreased chance of motherhood. Even just delaying the age of marriage leads to decreased fertility and reduced family size. While well, women are doing much better in measures like sports or business or college graduation rates, happiness has not come as part of the package. In fact, researchers have documented a decline in women's happiness. In 2009, the American Economic Journal published The Paradox of Declining Female Happiness by Stevenson, Betsy, and Wolfers. They documented that over a span of 35 years, women's happiness declined both in absolute terms and relative to men throughout the industrialized world. So why did they call it a paradox? Because everyone took it for granted that there was no downside to the sexual revolution and that happiness derived from money and power. Today's women are more likely to be depressed, more likely to experience anxiety and less satisfied with their life situations. Let's visualize this data in a couple of charts. In this graphic from the Institute for Family Studies, we see that the percentage of 25 to 50 year olds who have never been married in the dark blue has risen from 9% in 1970 to a whopping 35% today. The number who are currently married has dropped from nearly 90% to barely over 50%. What this chart doesn't show is that there's a strong economic component. The percentage of high income adults who've never married is in the low 20s but the percentage of low-income adults who've never married is over 40%. Mark Regneris, I think, has the best grasp of what's going on. In his work, he describes how while sex has become cheap, marriage is now very expensive. And when he says that marriage has become expensive, he means not just economically, but in the expectations of society and of potential partners. Because women are marrying later and less likely ever to be married, they are having fewer children than they would like. You can see in this chart based on data from the general social survey that there is a significant gap between the number of children women say they want to have on top and the number they will probably will have on the bottom. In fact, the gap is presently the highest that has been in 40 years. 
even by the beginning of this timeline, the fertility rate was already low. This chart doesn't show the dramatic plunge in fertility from 1960 to 1975 after abortion and the pill became widely available. For much of the last 40 years, birth rates have been below replacement levels. It wasn't just that abortion and the pill, along with the sexual revolution came declining marriage rates and a culturally sanctioned narcissism that encourages a perpetual adolescence that's incompatible with parenthood. Now people can believe whatever they want, but the reality is that, that having children is a high priority for most women and often foundational to their long-term happiness. Not all of them realize that, and it need not be true for all women. So just based on this brief overview, we can see that the sexual revolution hasn't exactly been all wine and roses for women in Western society, but that's just half the story. Men aren't doing so great either, but that's another story for another day. Well, I'm not even halfway through, but already some of these foundational assumptions don't seem to be holding up that well. Let's move to number six in our countdown. Chastity and monogamy are oppressive. If you guess that this had shades of Sigmund Freud, you'd be guessing correctly. They say that when your only tool is a hammer, the whole world is a nail. For Sigmund Freud, sex was his hammer. He attributed all kinds of psychiatric disorders, both real and imagined, to what he called repressed sexuality. As you probably know, although Freud had some good insights into the human subconscious, most of his work was complete bunk. He didn't do research so much as he simply made things up, and his theories have not held up well in the past 50 years. Well, people don't really read Freud, but they do watch TV and go to movies, and inevitably the narrative follows the same pattern. Characters committed to chastity or, or monogamy are repressed, judgmental, boring, and generally dysfunctional, or they're hypocrites and closet libertines. <clears throat> Producers and writers love to pretend that sex is harmless and healthy. The sex drive should never be suppressed. I think I've already given a few good reasons why maybe it ought to be suppressed, and there are more coming up. But let's take that myth as a hypothesis and let's go with it. What are the alternatives to monogamy and chastity? Well, basically, you're left with free, unconstrained sex and the elimination of marriage. It's not as if this hasn't been tried before. It was partially operational in Imperial Rome, at least if you were a male member of the ruling class. In the immediate aftermath of the Russian Revolution, radicals sought to abolish marriage and the nuclear family and set out to do exactly that. There was a resulting explosion in sexually transmitted diseases, abortion, and rape. The experiment was a disaster and was quickly brought to a halt. But when marriage and monogamy are really examined, I think they turn out pretty well. The research consistently shows that married people are happier, healthier, and even enjoy better sex lives. Social groups with a high percentage of married couples and intact nuclear families are more stable with lower crime rates, higher employment, and greater prosperity. On the right-hand side of the screen, you see From Shame to Sin by Kyle Harper, a professor of classics at the University of Oklahoma. Harper described how things worked in first century Rome. Male aristocrats ruled the roost. Upper-class women had some property rights. Any women further down, which was most of them, had no rights, including the right not to be raped by their owners or another powerful male. Christianity didn't impose the patriarchy. It invaded the patriarchy and overturned it. The only losers in the biblical arrangement are male sexual predators. So let's go on and talk about sexual predators. The activists of the sexual revolution don't deny that sexual predators exist. They simply argue that their ideology is not to blame. So how do they account for their existence? Well, I, I watched a documentary on the Harvey Weinstein scandal, and it was pretty good up until the end. The filmmakers asked about solutions, and it seemed everybody's answer was to get more women producers in Hollywood. It was just a matter of unfair power distribution. Well, I don't have any problem with having more female producers in Hollywood, but there still would be male producers, so you wouldn't be eliminating the problem. Also, how does that help the 99% of victims who are not wealthy, talented, and privileged starlets? How does it help the waitresses and hotel maids? On top of all that, their victims aren't always female. Has anybody here heard of uh, Kevin Spacey? Besides the issue of power, they bring up the matter of consent. Well, of course, consent's pretty important. 
but it's not exactly a Boolean quantity, meaning either one or zero. There are degrees of consent and situations in which it seems very ambiguous or contingent or one or both of partners is under the influence of mind altering substances. And of course, there's that perennial bête noire, what leftists term toxic masculinity. Well, actually, they have a point there, but their error lies in equating toxic masculinity with traditional masculinity. That's another equivocation fallacy. Only a lunatic would see any connection between raping women and declining to ordain them. Let's keep this toxic masculinity on the table for a moment. You all know about the Me Too movement. You've heard about the sex abuse scandals from the Boy Scouts and the Roman Catholic Church. The data shows that there was a spike in abuse cases during the 70s and 80s. Well, what's significant about the 70s and 80s? These were the decades immediately following the sexual revolution. If you really want to know what causes sexual predators, you need to study the predators. Well, I have good news for you. That's been done. In 1996, Neil Malamuth developed what he called the confluence model of sexual predator formation. He initially identified two elements in their development. The first was misogyny, a general contempt toward women. So yeah, toxic masculinity. It does exist and it's nothing we need to be defensive about. Let's just be clear about what it is and what it isn't. The second was casual sexual orientation. Now, casual sexual orientation has nothing to do with your preference of partner. It describes one's attitude towards sex itself, whether it is deep and meaningful and only within a loving, committed relationship, or whether it's trivial and something to be gratified whenever the opportunity arises. In other words, the exact opposite of a biblical position. Well, it turns out that both of these are strongly correlated with the formation of sexual predators. Mm -hmm. It took quite some time for the third pillar to be identified, but in the last decade, research has conclusively demonstrated that pornography is another major contributor to the development of sexual predators, which takes us down to number four in our countdown. Pornography doesn't hurt anyone. <clears throat> in the last few decades, pornography has become ubiquitous, and that's largely because of the internet. Conservatives always oppose pornography because of the moral implications and often tried to pass or preserve legislation, keeping it out of the marketplace. Unfortunately, this continued to be struck down by courts on the basis of First Amendment arguments. Intuitively, we figured out it really can't be that good for you, but it proved to be really hard showing that there was a direct connection between pornography and sexual misconduct. This argument has been going on for a long time, but in the last 10 years, the evidence for the danger of pornography has become very compelling. It might be that the early studies didn't show that much of an impact because by current standards, it was pretty tame. The Playboy magazine of 50 years ago has very little connection to the hardcore sort of stuff that is readily available today to your average 10 year old boy with a smartphone. Today, we know a lot more about pornography and what we know is damning. I've already mentioned some of the neurobiology behind sex and everything that I said about sex applies to pornography. You get the same dopamine effects and that which generates dopamine can lead to addiction. There's a strong link between pornography consumption and male impotence. Like any other addiction, it often happens that higher and higher levels of stimulation are needed to achieve the same effect. Unfortunately, for some of these people, real human females can't compete with the, the intensity of arousal they get from the pornography they consume. Clearly, this is going to have an impact on relationships, especially if the consumer of pornography is married or in a long-term romantic partnership. In the area of sexual economics, this is the cheapest sex of all. If they can gratify their sex drive this way, men needn't expend the effort to court a woman. Some simply drop out of the marriage market altogether, skewing the odds even further against women. From its earliest days, the pornography industry is based upon the exploitation and abuse of vulnerable women. Today, it has only grown worse. But building upon the previous myth, it is now firmly established that pornography has a causal connection to the formation of sexual predators. There's a large body of research showing that young people exposed to pornography have more lifetime sexual partners, mix alcohol and drugs with sex, engage in riskier sex, and are more likely to be sex offenders. 
Now here's a book and a website where you can access a wealth of scientific data on the matter. People are beginning to clue in. Here's a Saturday essay from the London Times just a few months ago. <clears throat> it's worth a read if you can find it. Here's a screenshot from the website I referenced, Your Brain on Poor. It looks like they have a lot of data, but what you see here is really just the table of contents. So after several decades of research, we now know that pornography really is bad, of, bad for you. You know, some of us knew that all along. These aren't ranked in order, but to me, this is the biggest lie. The children will be fine. Well, if we wanted to be snarky, we would add the qualifier, those children who are allowed to be born, but we don't want to be snarky now, do we? Throughout the decades following the sexual revolution, many of us expressed concern about the impact upon children. The continued refrain was that children are resilient. In fact, they will be just fine. Well, they're not fine. Now, there are a lot of constituents that really want this to be true. People who are divorcing or wanted to make it easier didn't want to feel burdened with guilt over its effects upon children. Another large category consisted of those who wanted to destigmatize unmarried childbearing. Of course, that's always a delicate situation. And while we don't want to make matters worse with our rhetoric, denying the evident harm serves no one. Early last year, Katie Foss and Stacey Manning came out with this outstanding piece of work. Katie has a long history as a children's rights advocate. She also has a personal connection as her parents divorced and her mother subsequently entered into a same-sex partnership. With the sexual revolution, everything is about gratifying the selfish desires and fantasies of adults. Children are treated as commodities. <clears throat> Both divorce and extramarital pregnancy result in children who are deprived of one or both parents. <clears throat> Sometimes that's tragic and unavoidable, but there's a sizable contingent of activists who see nothing wrong with those institutions. In so doing, they ignore a vast spectrum of research showing how hurtful they are to children. Kids raised without a father are at increased risk of dropping out of school, behavioral disorders, mental disorders, incarceration, poverty, physical and sexual abuse, early pregnancy, and almost every other me measure of social pathology. Kids raised without a mother don't fare all that well either. It's just less common. <clears throat> now, thanks to technology, we have an increasing population of kids who are conceived outside of sex by either sperm donation, egg donation, embryo donation, or surrogate pregnancy. This leads to a population of children who are permanently estranged from their genetic parents, and in the case of surrogacy, even their birth mother. The safest place in the world for any child is to be at home with his or her biological parents. Any departure from this in any direction raises the likelihood of physical and even sexual abuse. The most dangerous situation is when a child shares a household with an unrelated adult male. In one series, the risk of abuse was actually 50 times greater. Both divorce and extramarital pregnancy lead to the deprivation of either a mother or a father. Katie Foss made an excellent point in her, this book. She objects to the use of the word parenting because it really consists of two separate and irreplaceable components, mothering and fathering, and kids need both. But it gets worse. In same-sex partnerships, that's not a bug, but a feature. I would gather that most of you have had mothers and fathers, though you may not have known them or lived with them throughout your upbringing. But if you were lucky enough to grow up with both parents, which one would you have given up for a duplicate of the other? Would you have given up your father for a second mother? Would you give up your mother for a second father? Do you seriously believe they were interchangeable? But people do believe this, but it's despite all of the evidence and the universal sum of human experience. Remember I said men aren't doing so great either? Well, half of children are male, and this is where the problems begin. The children are not fine, and the sexual revolution is to blame. D counting down to number two, there is no meaningful difference between homosexuality and heterosexuality. Now, this is a really sensitive subject in the West, and for better or worse, LGBTQ issues have consumed most of the oxygen over the last 30 years. What do I mean here? I mean the narrative that they're socially, biologically, and morally equivalent, like height or hair color or right versus left-handedness, even something to be celebrated like here. 
Now it's hard to know how many people seriously believe this, probably a lot. I think it's fair to say that it's a foundational assumption in Western pop culture. Considering that homosexuals are regularly portrayed as helpless and powerless victims, and they have at times been really badly treated, there's a lot of sympathy going in their direction. A lot of people really want this to be true. I'm going to pass on any moral judgments. What are the basic differences from a social, medical, and biological standpoint? To be clear, even though we lump them in the same category, there are big differences between male and female homosexuality in psychology, plasticity, and sexual behaviors. Mostly, I'm just going to talk about male homosexuality. Point number one, it's pretty obvious that male homosexuals do not engage in what be, could be considered healthy physiologic sexual intercourse. The alternative pursued by most is extremely dangerous from a medical standpoint. The rectal wall is much thinner and less elastic, lacks the immune defenses of a woman's vagina, harbors dangerous pathogens, and ends in a sphincter which is essential to proper functioning but an impediment to misuse. This is one reason why a 2021 report from New Zealand published in the British Medical Journal found that relative to heterosexuals, gay and bisexual men faced a 57-fold increased risk of gonorrhea, a 163-fold increased risk of syphilis, and a 348-fold increased risk of HIV AIDS. But another contributing factor to the much higher rate of sexually transmitted diseases is that gay men have more partners than their heterosexual counterparts. This chart illustrates survey findings from the Austin Institute for the Study of Family and Culture. In the top row, we see that having more than 20 lifetime partners is over three times more common among heterosexual men. In the bottom row, an overwhelming majority of heterosexual men report fewer than 10 lifetime partners, but this drops to only 30% of gay men. <clears throat> In fact, this would be predicted according to the theory of sexual economics advanced by Baumeister and Regneris. While in heterosexual encounters, females act as gatekeepers and male to male relationships, the gatekeeper is eliminated. There's also a strong cultural component. During the AIDS epidemic, levels of promiscuity dropped precipitously, but in recent decades, it has rebounded within the gay population, according to a 2019 paper from the CDC. Another obvious difference is that same sex relationships are incapable of bringing new little humans into existence. Yeah, there are workarounds, but this is done for the benefit of the adults, certainly not the children. No child should be brought into this world purposefully, knowing that child won't have either a mother or a father, but it's happening through artificial insemination or surrogacy. It's well known that within the gay population, both male and female, there are much higher rates of depression, drug addiction, abuse, and suicide. The simplest explanation would be that it's just a naturally unhealthy state, and these are what we in the medical community would call comorbidities. But there's a competing hypothesis that blames society and those who don't accept it. This is called the minority stress theory, and of course is popular among those who want to deny any basic difference. Now, it's certainly possible that this is a contributing factor, but there's no way it can explain all the differences. And it goes against one of the most consistent principles in human psychology that nothing ever reduces to one simple cause. More than one researcher has pointed out that male homosexuals on average exhibit much higher levels of neuroticism as a core trait. And this may mean that they are much just more likely to interpret routine encounters as discrimination or abuse. So why does all this matter? Because there, those who refuse to admit any basic difference are forced to come up with alternative explanations for differences that are really quite obvious. <clears throat> so let's move on to our final myth. That's just the way God made me. Oh, that's really more of a theological statement than a scientific one. The implied claim is that if you can somehow attribute your behavior to something inborn rather than a matter of will, then you shouldn't be held morally accountable. <clears throat> I think it's been pretty convincingly settled that science cannot define morality. This goes back to David Hume, who concluded that you can never derive an ought from an is. For guidance on theology and morality, I direct everyone to the reference on the right of your screen. Of course, in the field of medicine, we know that we are born with all sorts of things that are bad for us. While probably well over 50% of illness among American adults is directly related to lifestyle and fully preventable, that still leaves a lot of disease. 
Tay-Sachs disease, a genetic disorder common among Ashkenazi Jews that attacks the central nervous system. Children with the infantile form almost never live more than five years, but they're also born that way. Now you might object that Tay-Sachs disease doesn't have any moral or behavioral connotations, and you'd be right. There's a fairly long list of behavioral disorders with a strong genetic component, including ADHD, Tourette syndrome, substance abuse, and schizophrenia. No human behavior or personality trait is exclusively linked to a genetic cause. Everything represents a mixture of nature and nurture. This principle also applies in the area of human sexuality. So what does the science have to say? Are they really born that way? Well, the jury's out on that one. The official position of both the American Psychiatric Association and the American Psychological Association is that the causes of same-sex attraction are unknown, but probably multifactorial. Based on twin studies and genome surveys, we can say with confidence that there's no gay gene and genetics plays a small role at most. So like most human traits, same-sex attraction seems to be a combination of nature and nurture. We find, for instance, that it's slightly higher among identical twins, but in the vast majority of twin pairs, if one is gay, the other is not. There's a small birth order effect in that younger male siblings are at increased risk over older ones, but it's also very wrong to say it's a choice. That might have happened in isolated cases, but must be extremely rare. Transgenderism is a whole nother story. Up until 2013, a person who believed they belonged to the other sex was diagnosed as having gender identity disorder. That diagnosis disappeared in the DSM-5, but not because of any scientific breakthrough. It was an accommodation to the political environment. That isn't science, it's sloppy metaphysics. It's scientifically and logically incoherent for a biological male to claim he's ontologically a woman or vice versa. This is because of the effects of sex hormones during fetal development in the early postnatal period. A young boy, even if puberty is blocked, is already two thirds of the way to mental manhood and can never go back. Do you remember those male female differences I talked about? I mentioned only a handful out of dozens, most present in early childhood, even infancy. Puberty is not required. But neurobiology doesn't cancel out human agency. Even among committed materialists, few are willing to go that far. We still have the ability to make choices. And because the brain is a very dynamic and adaptable organ, we still have some control over what direction it travels. Golf instructors love the saying that practice doesn't make perfect, practice makes permanent. That's quite true of the brain. Every time you indulge in particular thoughts or behaviors, you're forming connections. Keep doing it and those connections grow stronger. Practice does make permanent. The reverse is also true. That's probably why the Bible has so much to say about keeping our minds pure and our thoughts focused on righteousness. Paul didn't know any neurobiology, but God invented it. So let's land this plane. Here's my thesis. When it comes to sexuality, it is not Christianity that is in conflict with mainstream science. It is the prevailing cultural narrative. These issues are complex. There are those opposed to Christian morality can cherry pick data to support their own preferred narrative, and there's no way you can anticipate every objection they might raise. And this is just a summary. It might be enough for the average layman. Every topic demands a book to lay out all the evidence and deal with all the potential objections, but few have the time to devote to mastering this subject. I haven't mastered it myself, but I can point you to the people who have. Thank you for your attention. And that is the end of my presentation. Excited Thanks very much, Stephen. We've been listening to Dr. Stephen Willing on the 10 myths of the sexual revolution. I guess one of the obvious questions, Stephen, is uh, if this is all true, and everything you've said has been backed up by references, if this is all true, why is it that most people don't believe it today, particularly in the West, and that um, the Christian view is, is not only not believed, but often held up to, for, for ridicule. Well, that reduces to the whole domain of cognition and why people believe that things that they do. And in my book, Superbia, chapter three delves into that, why people form their beliefs that 
it's very hard to summarize. The, the, this most simple version is that we naturally assume that all of our beliefs are based on facts, logic, and experience. But the reality, and this has been exhaustively upheld by science, the reality is that our beliefs are also determined by peer influences, by emotion, by traditions, by heuristics, by simplistic thinking. There are whole, it's, my or a phrase that I use is that beliefs are like sausages. Um, there's a whole chapter on that. Even my chapter in the book is just a synopsis of a vast realm of research on why people believe that things they do. And lastly, there's a spiritual influence. Um, you know, there is a, there Satan is real, and his primary tool is deception. And the easiest way to deceive people is to tell them what they want to believe well you know most biases i talked to one of the factors behind beliefs is cognitive biases well most biases are self-serving and there is absolutely nothing that is more self-serving than the belief that you can have sex anytime you want with anybody who will so that's in a nutshell it's a it's a great question it's a, a crucial question i mean we really need to spend more time examining that uh, I just can't get give, do it justice right now. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned William Reich and the, if you like, the intellectual progenitors of the the sexual revolution. There's a whole stream of them, aren't they? And and most people aren't aware of the backstory uh, involving some of these folk and, and what you've just hinted at, that there may well be vested interests driving what they, they wrote. Um, any comments on that? Well, <laughs> you know, the, the background, if we got, if we spent too much time looking at the personal lives, we, yeah, you could see, well, it didn't work out very well for them in practice, but I see so much what CS2 is called bulverism that's active in our discourse. Bulverism is if you can discredit a person, then you don't have to, if you just say, well, their arguments are because they're a man, because they're a woman, um, you dismiss the person, you don't have to deal with the arguments. I, I think we should never resort to that. I think we need to address the arguments first. And then, you know, after, it, it's very interesting. And yeah, you often do see that they don't, in practice, their beliefs don't work out very well in their lives, personal lives. And so I think that brings us to the question of, of what, what can Christian doctors do specifically? Do, do we have a role in the church and society in addressing this, this issue? Because it, it seems to me um, that a lot of the best cr uh, critics of the sexual revolution are, are not, not even coming from a Christian worldview uh, basis. What can we do as Christian doctors? be available and maybe I think we may need to do a little pushing. I mean, there's a whole study, Mark Regneris, I referenced briefly. Uh, there's also, I have more resources on my website. Mark Regneris had an op-ed in the Washington Post a few years ago, and he's written four books published with Oxford University Press. The third one was called Cheap Sex. And it was at that time he wrote the op-ed that says, and I quote, it's not science that is secularizing Americans' youth, it is sex. That, and then um, Tim Keller recounts in a, a conversation with a uh, college chaplain, a college fellow who dealt with college students who said these college students would come to him and he said, well, you know, the student would say, well, I'm starting to doubt this things. I know I, all the things they taught me in church, but now I'm taking this course in biology or philosophy. And I'm starting to doubt. And the, the minister will look him straight in the eye and say, well, okay, so who are you sleeping with? And the student would respond, how did you know? Uh, so the church, we're seeing dropout rates. We're seeing a rise of the nuns. What's happening in the church is nothing less than a classic failure of discipleship. And I think that's largely because they have tragically neglected the importance of apologetics. It's not that they don't know what the Bible says. 
there seems to be a great mentality among preachers that if you just proclaim the word that that's all that's required and that itself achieves these kids know what the bible says they just don't believe it mm. so it's a tr now the, the physicians are available but it may take more pressure you might have to start putting more pressure on these you know pastors who don't support the role of apologetics to you know we really need to be taking this more seriously and you know expand our uh our, our concept of what discipleship really includes that it's not just enough to teach the kids the bible they need to teach the whys why the bible is true there's an anonymous question here Stephen. uh i agree that disconnecting sex and conceptions result in harm especially exploitation of women but i take issue with your statement that conception is god's intended outcome of sexual intercourse uh, what about, does that suggest that sex on days when conception is unlikely, sex after menopause or between couples who are unable to conceive might be inferior or missing the mark? Uh, just asking for clarification or elaboration. on what No, absolutely. Thought. I was not implying that at all. That, no, that, yeah. <laughs> I didn't mean to go that far at all. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't personally hear you say that, but uh, thanks for clarifying. For clarifying that, um, uh, questions on what well, question we've just had at the end of the day from Torsten Husby here: Does the question of sexual revolution burn down to a question of how we perceive the concept of freedom? Has the the whole idea of freedom lost its its meaning? Well, I. I'd be shooting from the hip on that one. Um, it probably, when you're talking about, say, something like government policy, then yes, it very well be. And I'm not maybe I'm not necessarily advocating that we should use government to enforce Christian sexual morality. Um, as far as individual freedom, then there is you know individual freedom from what I don't. You can, you can really define, determine the outcome of an argument by how you choose to frame it. If you want to frame it as a matter of personal liberty, then you can take the whole sexual argument in a totally different direction. I prefer not to frame it that way. I prefer to frame it as uh, what paradigm, what is the optimal pathway to human flourishing? That that is more important than personal freedom is what achieves the greatest good for the greatest number of people. And I don't mean like practical utilitarianism, I'm not going that far, but you know, what really leads to happiness, to peace, to prosperity, to health, mental health, physical health. And, you know, freedom is important. Um, and I'm I'm pretty conservative and, and sort of anti-authoritarian government sort of thing, but you know. I, I think guess there's a balance there. I was I was struck by uh, what you went for of the ten as the as the biggest, uh, which you said the biggest lie in, in terms of consequences. I think you were saying was that children would be free, and Define. you were quoting House Faust's book. Um, then before us, which was subtitled "Why We Need a Global Children's Rights Movement." Why, why are we not hearing more of this narrative? You know, uh, the the right of children to be in a stable environment. Do you think? And what can be done to correct that? Um, I guess many reasons. First sort of self-rationalization you know the we see the children are being harmed and that implicates the people who are causing the harm and you know it, the natural human tendency that's every almost all of this comes back to superbia <laughs> the book on pride which i hope you all take a, a look at because the natural human instinct we have this egoistic immune system you know our immune, our 
ego's immune system kicks in to defend us against any accusations, anything that would make us look bad or morally compromised. So you know, it's natural human tendency to defend their actions, to ignore evidence that it's bad and to to justify and rationalize now and if we if we did if we did hear about it where would be he who would be doing the promoting hollywood is totally in the tank for the sexual revolution um you know some i mean you know like i mentioned i read the times i mean the london times not the new york times the london times has done a great job with this the transgender movement and covering and reporting the the harm that's being done to children in a very specific little domain. I, I probably have a big blind spot on a lot of other areas. Um, but <clears throat> who's going to do it if not us, if not the church? I mean, and it's not it's not exclusive to the church. I mean, there are plenty of secularists who see an issue with this. Um, but there's there's a lot of self-serving bias, and then again, I'm very much uh, of the mind that there is the great deceiver is at work constantly. That the, the screw tape letters wasn't just fiction. I Lewis believed that demonic deception is real, and so do I. And it's most effective when the demons are telling us what we want to hear which comes back to, well, what we want to hear is that we can have sex anytime with anyone who will without any consequence. Yeah. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for your time, for your insights. And uh, I, I noticed you, you mentioned the, the London Times and you, you quoted an article in the, in the Times and uh, I noticed by Louise Perry, this book, The Case Against the Sexual Revolution, written by someone coming from a, a really strongly non-Christian position, but saying essentially all the things that you're saying has uh, made great waves over here. And uh, as you've been saying all along, it's a it's a case of when people really do look at the evidence, there isn't really uh, any answers that can be brought against that. So it just remains to me to say thanks again, Stephen, for your time mm -hmm. and for your wisdom and for all of you for joining us today on ICMDA webinars. May the Lord bless you and have uh, a blessed Christmas and New Year, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you.